Well, it's my pleasure to do this uh, non-live uh, streaming performance for you. Uh, I'll be talking to you today about uh, the application of uh, informatics, bioinformatics and metagenomics to uh, our project, which is to study bacteria and how they interact with fungi. Um, my name is Patrick Chain. I'm from Los Alamos National Lab, and I thought I'd give you a quick tour through the National Lab system if you're unfamiliar with it. We are part of the Department of Energy um, a complex of national labs. We're one of the larger uh, national labs with uh, almost 10,000 or, or more employees, um, uh, primarily not in biology, uh, which is the topic for today. Uh, we're in the middle of New Mexico, northern New Mexico. Um, very pleasant. Uh, if you haven't heard about us, uh, well, uh, it's fairly uh, famous currently, although it was a secret city at uh, uh, at the beginning or during the uh, the, bond, the effort uh, with the uh, with the war. And another thing that's kept uh, secret is that there is biology at Los Alamos. And in fact, um, uh, in terms of my area of study with genomics and bioinformatics, uh, Lanel has a long history uh, with um, essentially beginning the Human Genome Project there. Um, also, the uh, uh, the creation of GenBank also originated at Los Alamos before it was transferred to NIH. So. Um, uh, we study a lot of things using genomics and bioinformatics uh, as tools to investigate various uh, systems. But today, I'll be focusing on uh, on one project to look at um, bacteria and fungi. So, similar to um, to what we know now about uh, ourselves, the human microbiome, uh, and other animals. Uh, um, uh, it's becoming an accepted concept that uh, fungi also have um, a series of bacterial partners. Uh, and this concept is uh, starting to take uh, root um, uh, in the community with a lot more individuals studying bacteria and the relationship with fungi. Uh, I think a lot of this has come about due to genomics. Um, uh, I'm just showing here... Uh, one of the first discoveries I had paid attention to because it dealt with Burkholderia, which I was studying at the time, uh, and that happens to this particular species is a, an endosymbiont of uh, this rice pathogen uh, fungus, Rhizopus. Um, uh, and it turns out that it's the bacterium that actually creates the toxin uh, uh, for the fungus, uh, and so it's really the bacterium that's uh, harmful for rice. Uh, it also managed to hijack uh, uh, control of reproduction in the fun fungus, which is also of great interest. And since then, there have been a large number of studies um, uh, looking at all aspects of um, bacteria and how they interact with their fungal hosts. Um, we wanted to take advantage of this uh, brand new and emerging field uh, and uh, look a bit more broadly than these anecdotal examples. We wanted to see um, uh, the extent of, to which bacteria interact with fungi and, um, and how these uh, might uh, be controlled by us to manipulate larger ecosystems. So our focus is primarily on soil. This is a Department of Energy Office of Science funded project. Um, and one of the goals is to be able to use uh, reclaimed or uh, uh, poor land for biomass production, either for biofuels or for agriculture. Uh, and to do this, we, uh, we and many others are thinking about how we can um, uh, control the microbiome uh, to reach our end, end goals and desires. So we're interested in all manners of interactions between fungi and bacteria. Um, uh, some of our group or our collaborators have been studying how bacteria traverse these open air pockets in soils, um, these unsaturated soils, using um, fungal highway systems, so using the fungal mycelia to traverse uh, uh, open space. Um, 
We're also, of course, interested in endobacteria, similar to the first example I had uh, presented. Um, but we're really interested in what is the diversity and uh, is there any specificity to these bacterial fungal interactions and what are their implications uh, of these particular lifestyles on their evolution, uh, as well as how do they acquire or transmit uh, these uh, uh, bacterial partners uh, over time. Uh, so fortuitously, um, uh, a current postdoc uh, in our group was doing his PhD not very far away in uh, Albuquerque. Um, and part of his study was to look at this very interesting um, uh, group of fungi uh, called Monosporascus. Uh, they're quite cosmopolitan. Um, uh, they're found uh, across uh, this fairly arid southern uh, U.S. soils, and they're uh, associated with uh, plants. Now, normally, fungi are associated with um, a particular species of plant, but Monosporascus is not uh, very picky, uh, choosing uh, a large number of partners uh, with which to form associations. Um, and that was one of the first interesting things outside of it being found in a pretty wide geographic area. Um, another interesting uh, thing is how diverse it looks phenotypically when you grow it on, uh, on these nutrient uh, agar plates. Uh, these are different lineages or different lines of uh, Monosporascus, and you can see how they all look a little bit different. Um, uh, to the left, uh, I'm showing one particular strain of Monosporascus and how it grows in relationship to another uh, uh, isolate of Monosporascus. In many cases, you might see this inhibition zone where uh, this one strain is kind of inhibiting or where they're inhibiting each other to grow right in the middle. Uh, this is not true in the bottom left uh, chart of the, of the left picture, the bottom left corner. You can see when it's grown with itself, it grows happily in the middle. Uh, and we notice this also with a completely different strain. Uh, also, in the others, you'll see this pigment uh, forming right at the line of that, uh, of that zone of inhibition. Uh, in the top right corner, uh, we're looking at these two different isolates um, uh, with uh, four other isolates. And they seem to have a similar patterns, creating this inhibition zone and also creating this red substance, which we've zoomed into at the bottom. And this is a polyketide which, uh, called bicoverin, which um, is likely the, the root cause for this, uh, uh, this inhibition and control of other partners uh, in soil. We still don't know exactly what it does, but that's one of the hypotheses. Um, so Aaron had set out to uh, understand the genomic diversity of this very interesting uh, fungal lineage. And to the left, I'm just showing a tree of Monosporascus. Um, in blue were some of the lineages that were known already of existing uh, described species. Uh, and in red, um, in black were new isolates, and in red are ones that they selected for whole genome sequencing at the Joint Genome Institute, also run by the Department of Energy. Um, uh, interestingly, uh, in three of these lineages, in one in particular, uh, there was something unexpected found in the genome uh, assembly. So as Aaron was looking through the functional potential, um, he ran across these, uh, this very interesting uh, large contig uh, that assembled and looks a lot like uh, a bacterium. So as it turns out, three of these lineages, uh, three of these lines, uh, seem to have pretty strong signal for this Ralstonia uh, organism. And there's a tree to the right. You can see all, all three of these, uh, despite the lineages and the diverse nature of the fungal lineages they're found in, the, um, the Ralstonia Pichettii sequence uh, appears to be quite similar, at least um, uh, among these three different isolates. And that's a whole genome SNP tree to the right. So, um, uh, this was a fortuitous discovery. Most groups, when they're sequencing fungi, only uh, 
care about the fungi that they're sequencing and will discard what they consider contaminants. Uh, we wanted to see if we could take advantage of that and of the many uh, genomes that have been sequenced by the Joint Genome Institute. Uh, they have a fungal genomes project, which um, which uh, has focused on getting diverse lineages of uh, fungi sequenced. And so we wanted to look to see whether or not there were any particular patterns uh, of bacteria showing up in some of these different fungal projects. Uh, so another postdoc, uh, Jeffrey House, um, developed this pipeline to look at uh, at these uh, genome sequencing data. We also were doing at the same time screens of cultures, which I'll get to later. Uh, and so in this pipeline, it's simply assembly of uh, the raw data after some curation, um, and then uh, discarding anything that we can essentially guarantee is fungal host, since that's not what we're interested in these projects. Um, uh, and then look at all the rest of the assembled data and try to redo a new assembly, an improved assembly of just this focused uh, data and, and reads and uh, group these into bins of like contigs. So this is something that's traditionally done in metagenomics to try and uh, pick pieces of the assembly that belong together and try and assemble a full genome out of them. Uh, and then we try and classify uh, that bin of different contigs and see what it might be uh, taxonomically speaking. Um, we selected the two of the three um, fungal genome projects that Aaron had been involved in uh, with the strong signals of Monus Baraskis, uh, of uh, Rickettsia, uh, uh, sorry, Ralstonia Rickettii. And, um, uh, and use this as a way to discern uh, kind of the low end of where our cutoff should be to determine what and when we find a bacterial partner present. Uh, and so that is what we used as our uh, baseline cutoffs. Um, and what we found out of 412 uh, at the time uh, fungal genome projects was about 6% have a very strong uh, bacterial signal similar to uh, the Ralstonia signal in Modus Baraskis. Um, and so this chart to the left, uh, you can see the fungal um, genomes or some of the fungal genomes are listed to the left. Uh, they're color coded by their by the fungal phylum uh, that they belong to. So we looked at a, a number of different representatives or representative lineages. Uh, the bacteria that are found are at the bottom, uh, which is probably illegible on your screen as it is on mine. Um, and then the darker colored the dots and the larger the dots, the more data there was and the more of the uh, completeness of the uh, bacterial genome uh, uh, was assessed. And so you can see for uh, a number of these, there's a single um, a hit. Uh, I'm taking this particular one as an example since Mortiorella elongata is known to have an endobacterial partner called Mycoavidus. And so this was quite expected, but it also showed that this pipeline um, holds promise uh, for detecting strong bacterial signals. Uh, we also took two metagenomes, two uh, uh, bona fide metagenomes there, uh, uh, two lichen uh, metagenomes. And in lichen, you'll, uh, you often have uh, fungi associated with either cyanobacteria or with, um, with algae. And here we see uh, nostoc in this labaria uh, or um, linked with this Liberia lichen uh, as expected. Now, this cutoff is uh, fairly stringent. Uh, it has a sufficient amount of data so that your bacterial genome can actually assemble. Um, and then uh, it has to assemble well enough so that it can bin be binned together with the rest of the components of the genome. And so for the most part, you have primarily very well complete 
genomes, 50% or more complete, uh, that we're analyzing. But what of uh, bacterial partners that are not in high abundance with respect to um, uh, to their fungal hosts, it's possible that we're simply missing a lot of the signal. And so uh, Jeffrey has also started looking at read-based analytics, meaning we simply look at every single read from the data set and try to understand uh, what they might be hitting or which taxon uh, they may belong to, which, um, which bacteria they may belong to. Uh, in this, we also remove uh, what we deem to be uh, certainly the fungal genome host, and then we're looking for all of the rest of the data and look to see bacterial signal. And you can see here we find uh, bacteria at much lower uh, depths of coverage uh, or read uh, or amounts of sequencing. Here it's measured, uh, both of these axes, x axes are measured in uh, fold coverage of the fungal genome, but uh, that also just represents total amount of data. And so we get much better signals with read-based analytics. And I thought I'd segue just a little bit to tell you of some of our efforts in this area, but also some of the caveats and um, some of the pitfalls of doing uh, read-based analytics. So false discovery is the largest problem. Uh, sequencing reads are fairly short um, uh, outside of the uh, PacBio and uh, Nanopore long read technologies. They're quite short, even if they're high quality. Um, so they have little information content and trying to ascertain what an organism is from this short stretch of nucleotides is not always uh, trivial, uh, nor is processing so much data. And a lot of the tools out there have focused on the latter. Um, uh, we had worked for a number of years on a tool called Gotcha, which is at the top of this chart to try and specifically focus on optimizing for uh, for specificity uh, without losing too much sensitivity. Um, so on the uh, y-axis for both these charts, the chart to the left is work that we had done um, uh, maybe four or five years ago, and the chart to the right is something that's uh, a little bit newer and uh, typical test that we do with a mock data set provided by the Human Microbiome Project. Um, in both of these charts, uh, the, the left one is with um, a simulated community of 100 organisms. Um, and on the right, as I mentioned, is an, a mock data set of only 20 uh, different organisms or so. Um, uh, I'm showing the true counts on the left uh, with 100 organisms either identified or not correctly in blue, and then false negatives in green and uh, false positives in red. So organisms that are called, even if it's only by a few reads, um, to be present in that data set. On the, uh, on the right, it's just proportional base. But you can see that m many tools have this problem of uh, over-identification. Um, so what are the criteria for determining whether or not an organism is present? And this is a, an open-ended question that no one really has a great answer to. Um, you know, we, we all care about what uh, the important organisms are. Uh, and so the question is, does, uh, does it need to be abundant, abundant to fulfill a role in the ecosystem or to perturb the ecosystem or to, um, uh, or is it just important in the cases that you're interested in, such as pathogen detection, perhaps? Um, so it depends on what type of sample, um, uh, if you expect it to be highly abundant, uh, and also whether or not it's a highly diverse community that you're sequencing, since the majority of times you're sequencing many other things uh, at the same time. And even if it's uh, only one organism with a host, the host may uh, completely overwhelm signals from, the, from smaller uh, genomes or smaller organisms. Um, so these are all considerations. And uh, in addition, how do you find novel organisms since the hits won't be perfect? Uh, and they may, in fact, hit to a number of different uh, references. Uh, the reference database itself is uh, of primary importance. Um, uh, and there are issues with the current, uh, with the status of the current databases, both in terms of 
nomenclature issues, uh, contamination and misnaming issues, but also just in general bias, uh, since we uh, have sequenced a lot more pathogens than environmental uh, organisms. Um, so we've sought out uh, to develop uh, a scoring system that isn't 100% tied to relative abundance or to abundance. Um, so I'm just showing you uh, conceptually how this newer system might work. Uh, we have a FASTQ file. We have a number of different databases, and we try and keep them both up to date and fairly complete. Uh, and we use our initial effort with our gotcha uh, tool to identify unique signatures in all genomes. And uh, with that, we can look at uh, data at any level of taxonomy uh, and see at what level of taxonomy is that sequence unique, um, uniquely found. And then we can give you rank specific mapping results. And uh, and we can add a couple of different scores to this, either looking against the background, if you are looking at uh, environmental perturbation, um, uh, or uh, using a score that's, uh, that's based on our database, as we currently know it, despite its flaws. And so any one genome will have some portions of the genome that are specific to the strain, or to the genus, or family, or the, to the phylum. Um, and we can group these as such. And uh, for every genome in the database, we already have this calculation performed since we've done an all by all uh, comparison. And so this gives us kind of this um, posterior probability of what we might expect if we were to randomly sample this genome. You know, what's the probability that I would uh, get something at the, the genus uh, level that's specific? And then with that, or, you know, what is the What's the probability that it is that that genus? Um, and so, uh, uh, coupling onto this, uh, it's not always easy for a biologist to approach bioinformatic tools. Uh, there are a number of dependencies. There are a number of issues. So we've been playing around with uh, in a number of different efforts on how to make uh, bioinformatics methods more available and amenable to biologists. Um, and so I'm annotating uh, essentially a screenshot of a web page uh, output from, uh, from this tool, which will provide you uh, an overview dashboard of what you found, um, uh, spe specific results, as well as a number of different metrics, like how many reads map to every organism, and then uh, an interactive map, a dot plot showing you uh, the data, and then more information below, which I'll go through in just a second. Um, you can toggle any of uh, the parameters and then see real-time uh, differences in your results. So you can adjust these uh, filters or search things by taxonomy. You can switch things to the strain level. So you can look at uh, by genome uh, hit. Uh, uh, you can uh, lower uh, all of your filters so that you can uh, find more organisms that might be at much lower abundances or where there are only a few reads that map to the genome. And you can mouse over these and get more details, uh, look at whether or not you've got complete or incomplete genome coverage, uh, and then add a number of features uh, to this. Um, everything will eventually hit our, uh, our open source GitHub repo. Uh, and we will also be integrating as we do with most of our tools into our Edge Bioinformatics platform, which is a separate project I don't have time to talk about today. Uh, but you can visit any one of these sites, and uh, it should lead you to further documentation and to, um, uh, and to more information. Um, so uh, for uh, fungal bacterial interactions and bacterial signatures, so we showed just the genome screens and how we have been successful finding uh, actually a large number of different bacteria in a large and diverse um, uh, of fungi. Uh, uh, we also have access to a number of culture collections uh, from Europe, from the US, um, and from South America as well. Uh, 
And we want to screen these using uh, more traditional um, 16S community profiling. So this is where you're amplifying a portion of the ribosomal RNA sequence, and uh, you're uh, trying to identify uh, what taxa are present in your sample. Um, these are fungal collections that have been passaged uh, sometimes years. Uh, others were uh, fairly fresh. Um, and this very complex heat map essentially shows you uh, in color from yellow to dark uh, whether or not uh, things have been found that are abundant. On the right this time, you have the, the different fungi, fungal lineages that have been screened. So hundreds of strains have been screened, and we have found uh, hundreds of different bacterial genera. So we only went down to the genus level, uh, and you can see some of them uh, are found across a number of different fungi, and others are more specific to independent uh, families or, uh, or specific strains of, of fungi. Um, we want to prove that these 16S signals are real, and so we've performed a number of different microscopy tests. This is a fish uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization uh, stain of um, uh, using 16S, uh, a universal 16S probe uh, against Rhizopus, uh, one that we obtained from ATCC culture collection. Um, and this is a burkled area that's known to be associated with rhizopus, and we see it quite clearly. Uh, and then we've also screened our, uh, our unique uh, collections of fungi, and we have found similarly that some of them have uh, a mild to very high burden of what appear to be uh, bacteria uh, inside uh, the fungal hyphae. Uh, and I don't have confocal images to show you, otherwise I could show you that we do believe they're actually inside. Uh, one signal uh, that uh, had perturbed me uh, originally was the last signal. Um, uh, it is found in a number of different fungi, and we thought this was simply a matter of um, bioinformatic uh, error, uh, you know, uh, parameters you are, whether or not um, we had some level of contamination. To the right, I'm just showing a zoomed in just of that uh, chloroplast line, and you can see it's spread really throughout uh, uh, all the different uh, fungal phyla. At the very bottom are unclassified phyla, uh, I should have mentioned. So, you know, fungi, for all I remembered uh, from even grade school biology, maybe not grade school, but high school biology, was that um, uh, fungi do not have them. And uh, Wikipedia backed me up. Of course, they're not the uh, ideal source. So there are a number of uh, new and older papers. Uh, there are textbooks that uh, tell you they that none have chloroplasts, or there have been presentations where this is one of the top things that uh, that are presented, and uh, even uh, scientific flyers describing fungal cells that uh, essentially are without chloroplasts. So. Um, so we were set to prove that we uh, that we had this signal, and it was just a contaminant of sorts. Um, uh, but due to uh, a very um, persuasive set of students and uh, and studies, um, uh, we uh, we believe we've found otherwise. This is just showing you an abundance profile of. The different uh, of different fungi on the x-axis, and the amount of uh, chloroplast signal found in each fungal lineage. So we find it across all three collections. Um, uh, it can be up to twenty percent of all sixteen S data. Um, uh, they are found across different lineages of fungi, um, and. Uh, the next thing to ask was sequence similarity-wise, were they all the same sequence? Because that would point perhaps to uh, contamination. Uh, on the corona plot that just shows the distribution of uh, taxonomies that we've assigned uh, these DNS to. And on the was a bit more intricate uh, phylogeny um, 
of this short stretch, about 400 or so base pairs of uh, the 16S sequence, coupled with um, uh, a number of different sequences of uh, chloroplasts from uh, many different trees or plants uh, from algae and, uh, and also uh, 16S from cyanobacteria, uh, which is at the top in blue. And you can see uh, the dots, uh, the different colored dots uh, represent um, four different collections that we've screened. Um, and you can see they're spread throughout this tree. Uh, and the, the lowest large clade on the right is uh, all land plants. Above it, uh, in, in dark green, are uh, algae. Uh, and then above that, in uh, cyan color, are the cyanobacteria. So we, um, we have done a good job not picking cyanobacterial 16S sequences in this analysis and really focusing on those that we believe are chloroplast-like uh, but they um, they appear uh, to hit throughout the tree. Uh, so we followed this up uh, also with fish staining, designing a chloroplast-specific probe that uh, tested negative on negative controls. And this is one picture showing uh, how it looks um, uh, with this fungal uh, hypho mat and a close-up view um, uh, showing you the structure that we find uh, it has along hyphae, along fungal hyphae. And this is with a uh, environmentally obtained isolate of Mordiorella, um, which is known to uh, frequently associate it with um, a few different types of bacteria, uh, uh, but not before characterized to associate with uh, chloroplasts or have chloroplasts. Um, uh, the story is to be continued. We're investigating this on about eight different fronts. Uh, we have found signatures in other data sets that are not generated by us. Uh, so we do believe this might be real and fairly novel uh, discovery. Um, uh, switching topics, however, uh, we're also interested in bacteria that are not uh, simply inside fungal cells. So most fungal culture collections, they've been passaged sometimes with using antibiotics to get rid of uh, uh, contaminating exobacteria. And so um, collaborators uh, that are part of our project, um, uh, Saskia and Pilar, um, uh, have been interested in developing techniques to look at these uh, bacteria that are associating with the outside of fungi. And as I mentioned before, bacteria are kind of limited in where they can move due to water biofilms and water biofilms that form inside uh, inside soils. But soils are uh, mostly unsaturated. Uh, fungi do quite well in unsaturated systems, and bacteria can use these uh, fungi as highways to traverse uh, open space. Um, and so uh, Pilar and her group had developed these um, fungal highway columns uh, with filters to prevent mites or anything else um, larger than fungal hyphae from traversing uh, into, the, into the middle uh, portion which is filled with agar um, uh, that can attract uh, soil organisms um, since it's exposed directly to soil. And at the top, there's another um, uh, plug of agar uh, that attracts fungal hyphae to traverse this open airspace, which is filled with beads representing soil structure and, uh, and reach the top. And then you can look specifically at what's up top um, that managed to traverse this open space. Uh, we have several models of this. These are all handmade or hand designed, so they're not entirely consistent. Um, uh, but we have done a number of replicate studies and have isolated a number of different fungi and bacterial isolates. Um, uh, we, for the fungi, we've used uh, uh, antibiotics to um, uh, to counter select bacteria and then look inside those fungi for endobacteria as well. And we're characterizing these in much the same way that we've characterized all the other data that I've presented thus far. Um, we've since designed a 3D model of this so that we can more consistently 
offers this and out to other groups that are interested in um, soil fungi or soil bacteria that use fungi to traverse these air pockets. Um, and these are also going to be used or are being used in a number of outreach efforts uh, teaching uh, the next generation of scientists um, more about how important uh, microbes are uh, to the well-being of, uh, of everyone and the environment. Um, so uh, with that, uh, we have a large team as part of this uh, science focus area project on bacterial fungal interactions that span uh, a group in Switzerland at uh, Université de Neuchâtel, uh, as well as University of Houston, Colorado State, Vanderbilt, um, uh, and a number of other upcoming collaborators. Uh, and a lot of the work uh, that was done by the postdocs and students um, as part of this group has also been supported by a large array of genomics and uh, bioinformatic personnel um, uh, that are really the underpinning uh, for all the uh, analytics. Um, we have a GitHub site for the uh, software that I had mentioned. Um, uh, from there, uh, links to websites and papers. Um, uh, my email was on the first slide. Uh, you're welcome to email me if you have any questions. Um, and uh, I thank you very much for your attention.